Okay. Um, welcome. Hi. Thanks everyone for joining us. It's just, just after 7, so if we start around the room and do some introductions, if anybody else joins us, we'll give them a minute to come in. My name is Judy Talbot. I'm helping with facilitation services. Let's go around, Doug. Rainbow resident in Cagna. Thanks, Chad. Thanks, Marco, Rainbow resident. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Steve. Do you speak up so we can hear you? Can you hear us, please? Yes. Okay. Uh, Ken Patron, New Jersey DEP. I'm Joe Siegel, U.S. EPA. Thank you, too. Right, Seth, U.S. EPA. Joe Gower is an EPA project manager for the site. Thank you. Tom White, Oakland resident. John Spear, Mayor of Borough of Greenwood. Uh, Sarah Tedrico, State County, Department of Health. Craig Cosmo, the Maximus. Peter Sandow, Greenwood resident. Charlotte, I used to be a resident of Greenwood. Now I'm a resident of West Okay, thanks. You probably saw that we have quite a few handouts. One of the one of our goals is to try and get information about the meetings out in advance so that people have access to it. We're working to make sure that as much information goes out to everybody at the same time. If there are materials that we have at the meeting that weren't sent out in advance, we will follow up afterwards and send out an email saying, here's the other materials. We're really working on providing consistency with that so that everyone is informed and it's all shared. Today, we're going to briefly go through the agenda. The first thing we're going to do is approve the meeting minutes for May 10. Joe, did you bring up the, uh, the handouts for the progress report? Yeah, okay, great. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We're going to do some follow up from the previous meeting. One of the packet materials for today is the report from Excel Environmental Resources. It's dated May 21st, so very comprehensive, and I think this will complement. Mayor Spear, you're going to speak briefly about the testing? Yes, Andrew. And I think this will supplement it. It was dive into detail. As you can see it's pretty comprehensive. Then uh, an update from the New Jersey Department of Health Report. Griffin is going to provide that. Our guests are going to talk about the upcoming NYU presentation in two weeks, correct? That will be right here. And then an update on the letters to New Jersey Drinking Water Supply. Uh, North Jersey. Uh, North Jersey, mm -hmm. okay. And to Pete Lopez, who's been a response back. That, after we wrap up that, the EPA comments on O2 and O3, we were waiting for some comments from the, is it the hydrogeologists? That well, we, we, yeah, we have those comments, and those are, those are basically incorporated. Correct. Yeah. So we were pending those on the last meeting. I will give you an update on the maps and handouts because uh, it's not as graphic as people might hope, so we'll look at some other options for what that recycling plant looks like. And then we'll go into some administrative tasks on the CAG operating procedures. At the last meeting, there was some discussion about edits to make and some revisions to the graphic for the Superfund process update that makes it a little easier to read public comments and next steps. And one of the things that we'll do is uh, a recap of the progress report 
and then talk about making this permanent home for the CAG meetings. Is there anything that people expected to have on the agenda that they don't see or anything they'd like to add? Will we have questions after the presentations? Yes, we'll, okay. we'll have uh, time for that. In the packet is the minutes for the last meeting. And thank you to Cornerstone, who does these. It's a great Demaximus. I'm on the learning curve and the is still behind. So Demaximus graciously does these and a great job. Any comments um, from the CAG changes that might need to be made? Have people had a chance to look at this?
Uh, there's another spot down here at the, at the south end of Skyline Lake. Um, that's actually the location of the pump station, that little Jenkins Park right there. We got the pump station. That's what that is. There is no production well going on there. Our production well is actually on Beasley Lane, which you have to get to from, from Ringwood Avenue. Um, so you have it. I have, I have the, uh, what the pump capacities are in each one of these. They generally do not pump close to the pump capacities. Uh, I put on the uh, elevation as was listed on the water allocation permit, as long as the well as well as the current as the well depth. Printed out the final elevation for you, did a little arithmetic, and just took some Google Earth measurements from uh, actually where I focused really was on the southeast corner of what's delineated has the Peter's Mine Pit area. Uh, because that's where all the contamination is coming from, is the Peter's Mine Pit area. Um, a couple things come to mind. Um, uh, are from, from the Peter's Mine Pit area to well number two, which is our closest well to it, that's Valley Road. Yes. Can you do me a favor, just point out the four, or yes. all four the four? Um, that, that, if, if you follow the text in, number, well, number, well number two is at Valley Road, uh, somewhere between Upper Lake and uh, Ryerson School, back in the woods. Um, that, that well itself pumps directly into the piping system. Um, then we have Brookside, and we have the Sand Pit. These kind of work in tandem. They have one treatment facility to, uh, that, that, that they share. What happens is we pump out of the Sand Pit. The Sand Pit is by the library. We pump out of the Sand Pit. It goes into a treatment plant at over at the Brookside Wellhouse, maybe 100 feet from the, from the natural well itself. That, there it joins water from that is pumped out of Brookside and gets treated. And I think it gets treated just like disinfected with some chlorine, there's hardness, there's a couple different things you do, but it's all pretty pretty simple and when everything's working right, it's simple, I should say. I should, I should, I should, yeah, yeah, I shouldn't tempt fate. Um, so, so these two wells act together. Um, out of the Brookside treatment plant, you can either go directly into the water system or you can get pumped up to the top of Skyline Drive over at, uh, we call it the 792 tank, we just spent like uh, 1.2 million dollars redoing that thing. 792 is the elevation of the, of the top of the, of where the water starts to overflow that tank, which tells you how much pressure you have in your whole system. That's why these water guys call it the, the 792. Um, our big well, our big production well, is uh, the BD Lane well. Uh, you get that right before you get into uh, into Wanakiru. BD Lane is a shady little lane. And it's uh, it's pretty cool. It's only paved like the first couple hundred feet or something. Go back there. There's our big well. Um, that thing has a as a pump in it for 500 something gallons per minute. I think it's only producing about half that. Um, I think that's all we actually need. Um, that well from B that water from BD Lane gets pumped up into the Skyline Lakes pump station, which is that. Other miscellaneous area at the south end of, of, Skyline, of, uh, of Skyline Lake. From there, it can go directly into the water system or it can pump directly into the 792 tank. Um, and from there, you know, by, by, by the force of the water up, up, up there and also at the, uh, the hilltop tanks, which are almost as big combined as, the, uh, as, that, as that 792, our main tank. That's how they pressurize the whole system. Um, Where's the, uh, if I can ask, of course. where's the primary distribution point where it goes to the, yeah, to just, the supply line? Uh, there will be three locations where water's going to enter into the, into the pipes that go into people's houses. Okay. Um, well number two, Valley Road, uh, the Brookside pumping, uh, pumping and Treatment Station, and the treatment station down, down here at the uh, at line. And then and from there, you can get directly into the, into the water system. That's where the water is tested. So when you see the, uh, the Excel environmental report, uh, you'll see that they, they talk about uh, three different treatment uh, plants that they, that they tested. And I think what they do is they test on the inlet side before the treatment happens. They test that water right there. So when they're testing Brookside, they're actually testing water from two different locations, one at the library, one at Brookside. Um, so we got the, 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 so those two locations are, are the main locations where you see all the testing, and that's where uh, that's where the testing was done in 2013, 
2016 for the 1,4-dioxane. That's where the testing occurred. Um, so we have a, we have a, a couple of things come to light. Number one, to get to uh, the Valley Road well, it's about uh, I say 2.0, oh, 3.25 miles to the Peters Mine Pit. As the crow flies. As the crow flies. Yes, all these numbers, all these all these are, are just direct all the right off the Google Earth. Um, so that's that's about three miles to three three and a quarter miles to, to the Peters Mine Pit area. Well, number three at Brookside would be the next closest, and that is 3.7 miles to the to the Peters Mine Pit area. Um, of note is that the the furthest it seems that the uh, that the contamination has spread would be, I guess, the surface water of the Park Brook as it enters Sally's Pond. And Joe, you can't can you fit? Um, so, so that's about the furthest extent of and of contaminated water. water. That is up here. I, I labeled that point as point C. C. Okay. Yes. Um, so, and that's, so that means that um, you know this water that that, that contamination is traveled about. 0.78 miles. Um, what that tells you is it's another. You know, about three quarters of a mile. It's about three quarters of a mile, whereas this is three and one quarter mile to get to the first well. So this is its travel time in mm -hmm. the 50 years. I don't know if that's perfectly accurate. I would be thinking that maybe 25 years ago the extent was further, but now has itself just you know is, is losing its volume of this source. So, but you know. But I don't know, it is what it is. That's what, that's what the data is. is, is <laughs> um, as far as, and I need you guys to tell me, I am, the furthest groundwater uh, that, that's been detected, I think there's been low levels detected in yes. overburdened wells close to Southland's Ponds. Right. Um, but they're, are they above groundwater quality standards? Or no, they're well below. They're well below. Ground so, so in order to get to a place where you have groundwater quality standard infractions, you're going to have to push much closer to the O'Connor disposal area, which actually within the bounds of the site. Um, so there's, as far as groundwater quality goes, from from the groundwater quality standards perspective, um, this groundwater leaving the site is meeting the standards. Um, there's no reason to. This, there's also uh, one thing: our closest well, which one would think is being, you know, geographically closest, would be the one that's closest to being at risk. Um, the bottom of that well, I have it at, at elevation 359. Um, the Wanakee Reservoir is at elevation 300. Uh, Sally's Pond, I put it up there, it's at 345, because that, that, that brook is ripping, the brook, the ring of the brook on its way down. Um, but in order for groundwater, this, oh, sorry guys, I didn't tell you this, uh, Valley and uh, Brookside are in rock. Uh, they're deep. They're 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 kind of deep. They're in they're in rock. Uh, they call it Precambrian rock. Um, the other two, uh, Sand Pit. Guess what that's made out of? And BD Lane, which we chased the same vein of sand down, you know, down to the south, and, and found another spot where we could pick up water. Which is what they did back back in the day. Um, those are both in, in what they call stratified drift. You know, which is a, a glacial deposit, sandy. Gravity, um, great stuff, moves water fast. So, in order for this water that's up in here in our fractured bedrock aquifer to get to here, it would have to go underneath uh, the Ringwood Brook, it would have to go underneath the uh, Cupsole Lake before it gets <coughs> to our well. It would have to go uphill, it would have to defy gravity in order to get it to our nearest well. Um, just another reason why I'm, I'm I'm pretty comfortable with, with the data these guys are telling me when they tell me that there's no threat. I'm kind of thinking there's no threat. Um, so, all the data is there. I made copies for everybody. Anybody got any questions? Yes? The purple outline that you delineated yes. in that regarding the Superfund. Yes. Is that supposed to be a delineation of the Superfund area? The Superfund site boundary. Okay. Yeah. So it goes. That far uh, south of Mark. Oh, sure, sure. Man. You remember when uh, uh, Chief Man found some found some sludge coming out of the side of the old site of the church of the uh, of, of St. Catherine's Church up there, 
Um, when he did that, Ford responded by doing a, an investigation of 250 acres south of Margaret King Avenue, and they walked it, and I know what it was, it was like, you know, every five feet they're walking a line. The 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 um, yeah, they, they, so, so they did a pretty good, and, and this was after they'd done their original, you know, their, their original study, they did it again, just to make sure there's, there's nothing, you know, we're well, never going to make sure. We're, one thing we've learned, these people put the crap everywhere, they had, they did not care, they just dumped it. Um, but that's, so that's, yeah, that, that area there, and, that, that, and that's been looked at. Hopefully we don't see anything pop up again. And so there's two deliverables. One that I still owe you is the larger map that I got from Ken a while ago. It's a, a big map of the area that has the sampling locations on it. And I'm going to get those plotted. I have not yet. And if we are able to take this, I'll plot the full size and make copies for the CAG number. I might be able to send you a PDF on it. Okay, great. You know, and then, great. then you can circulate that way. Let me see if I can okay. get, I get that done. Because this is about to all my graphic capabilities. All right, this is about as good as it's going to get. No, that's excellent. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to just one other quick note. Um, oh, there was a question. There was a question. I saw the question. The question was, is this is this sampling of one four dioxane going to uh, was that did we just remove up the schedule? So here was my question. I looked at the um, new the press release and it said no, that oh. not press release. <laughs> we didn't wait right The news article. You 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 long enough. I did the press release. Yeah. yeah. So the news article <laughs> and it said that thank you for the clarification. <laughs> is that they had moved up the 2019 date. And so my question to the borough was, well, are you, does this replace the 2019 sampling, or how does that work? And no way. No way. The 2019 sampling is, is dictated to us by the people who regulate our system. There will be sampling in 2019. So this was an added one. This was an added one. We, the, we had the... We had the 2013 where we got a hit, and then they came back in September. Here we got a hit in the spring, and we came back in September, it was non detect. They came back in 2016, it was non detect. The 2013 hit still kind of bothered you. Even though we've learned that the laboratory analysis of 1,4 dioxane has gotten a little more sophisticated in the in the, in the interim. Um, so, I made a decision to go out and just grab some grab some tests. Let's let's see if we got a final, you know, what, what's the tiebreaker? Tiebreaker came back non-detect in, in the three locations. <clears throat> um, also, as part of our uh, regular testing that's dictated to us by NJDEP for our water allocation permit, uh, we ran out and tested these wells just recently um, for volatile organics and nitrate. Um, all three locations of the treatment plants that they take these samples came back on to tech for benzene. Um, they came back on to tech for just about everything. I think they had some core form in there, but not enough that it meets the combined trihalo, whatever you guys do. Trihalo, you right? Okay, so, so all, everything came back very good as far as the, 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 uh, the, the volatile organics in our wells. When was that? That was in May. May. Yes. And that was on the three-year schedule. Yes, in so, yes. Yeah. So um, I was surprised that you did test the one for dioxane because there wasn't any uh, information that you were was going to test because it is not really part of the protocol at mm -hmm. this point. Yep. So glad that you did it. So you're saying now that you are going to be testing the one for dioxane every three years? No, right. um, no. I don't know when we were testing for one four dioxane. I don't know why there would be a reason for us to test for one four dioxane. Let um, me just ask, what's the sampling in twenty nineteen? What is that? What's that sampling? Okay, there's some kind of <laughs> uh, anybody can help me. Unregulated, 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 unregulated chemicals. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so there's, there's a new bunch of chemicals they want you to test for besides the, the, the old ones. And this is coming out on a, on a rolling three-year cycle, and, okay. and, and we've been in, yes, so we're following that protocol that, 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 that they established. 
So you don't see any reason at all to test the one for dioxin again? Correct. Okay. Because it came non detect. Uh, because it's come non detect in 2016, 2013, 2016, and 2018. And we're going to test for it again in 2019. So and probably 2027. Okay. Well, that's what I asked you. You're going to test in 2019 for one for dioxin? Oh, absolutely. No, we, we have. I to. think we just misunderstood this. I think there was a disconnect. So I yeah, yeah, no, yeah. It, it was a sloppy sentence in the article. No, so you had. It was. It was a sloppy said, Why would we test the one for dioxin? So oh, yes, yes. But by the testing we did just, just now, uh -huh. just, just this year, the ad was, hoc. Was, 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 was ad hoc. Yes. I like that. I was going to say petulant, but <laughs> ad hoc. So you have a regularly scheduled one for dioxin in 2019? Is that Yes, correct? yes. And then Along with the other components of okay. the UCMR. So that's part of the three year. It's part of the UCMR. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. So this is something that's required now. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't know how long that goes. It's part of the process of the agency requiring monitoring of these new contaminants and determine whether or not we need to regulate it. Okay. And this is something new though, isn't it? I mean, I've never heard this before. No, it's, it, and the UCMR, it, 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 it's, it's Clean it's Water Act stuff. It just keeps yeah, on so rolling. Oh, it okay. passed the Clean Water Act and all of a sudden the thing just grows fangs. And, and it just comes out. Yeah, no, they're, they're, they're regulated. Is there parties. a chance that that might be uh, part of the discussions on OU3 or it's a different, it's a different part? Well, if this, you, um, no, no, UCMR is something different. It's, it's not part of the Super Club program. Okay, so this is yeah. okay. so That's a TPA drinking water. A lot of moving parts here. Yes. Right. Thank no. you for your clarification. So they tested ad hoc. This time. Yes. Next time they're going to test because it's part of this program. Yes, yeah, part of the department of regulation. And, um, and then in 2022. Probably, yes. Yeah. That's See, the program is still it's required. Fine, right. right. Uh, there, there might be some new boogeyman chemicals by that point. You know. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Well, it's definitely a boogeyman contaminant in Greenwood because uh, a whole Superfund site is contaminated with mm -hmm. one for dioxin. Does by line. Does anybody have other questions? About this, I do. Okay. okay. So, um, first of all, how deep is the shaft? The shaft is 232 feet. Right, mm -hmm. and that's where the mainly is contaminated. And that's where we detect the high right. So, if you're saying that the water, the groundwater, has to go uphill, I don't understand that because. Happening way down because, the ground. Yeah, it actually does sound here. And your well, the other well is up here on the hillside. You, you, you're talking about the middle of the middle school. So you're at a different elevation, and that's what he's trying to indicate. Is that you basically, it flows down, gets to the bottom of the valley. It's at this elevation. The screen where, where that well is up on the hillside the is screen, actually at a higher level than the bottom of the valley, where, where the, uh, the reservoir or the river salad pond is. But didn't you just uh, no, I said it's at elevation 359. The elevation, not the depth. Yes, so no, that's the elevation. Yes, yes. yes. like, like what's the, after the 232, <coughs> yeah, where, where are we? Where is it? Well, then here's, here's my shaft. Was so that, so that elevation 500-ish? Yeah, it's at 500, but then you're down 200. You go down to the 230. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so that So you're at 700? No, no, we'll yeah. subtract. Okay. You go down in the pit. Got it. Down in the pit. In the shaft is 200 feet, 225 you're saying. It's 200 feet below ground oh, surface. Right. Now, we're, surface. we're talking about different, yeah. uh, different levels here. These are like yeah. deep compared to the sea level. Right. We're talking about the ground surface down. down. Yeah. Right. And so what we have to do is a little math calculation. Get yeah, but the, the bottom line is the, what the uh, here is indicating is that basically the groundwater here basically at the, at the bottom of the valley yeah. is basically lower than where the screen is for the well, of well number where they well test. Two, where they test it. Where they so test that's why you said you have to have water flowing up there. Right. But where they test, is that at the, the depth of the well, is what I'm asking you? The, how deep is the well? We, we tested the, the, the well. I think the well is probably still a little bit deeper. The well is 236 feet deep, well number two. So even if you're testing at the screen, you don't know what's going on at the deck. Am I crazy? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. 
you're, you're, you're testing the water that comes out of the spigot before it goes into the treatment plant. You can't test water, you know, that, I mean, these guys can test water that deep. Right. The guys who do this stuff, they, yeah. they turn yeah. a test cock yeah. and they fill, up a, they fill up a beaker. So so part of this is, is that if you have contamination occurring at depth, yeah. either you would expect to see it mixing and being present at the spigot. At the spigot. And the test is at the spigot. So, so the thing is, it's all it's part of the bathtub, um, so to speak. Is you've got your well, you've got a depth that's at the bottom, and if you saw contamination, would you expect uh, if that you not find it? Well, again, what do you, what do you, I mean, basically, I think what you're trying to get at is the fact that you have a well, which or if the air shaft is at about. It looks here it's probably at about. 360, 370 feet, maybe. Uh, Actual sea level rooms? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it looks like the well at. Valley. Um, yeah. Is 200 meters saying? No, no, no. no, no, no sorry. It's the finished elevation. Okay. Uh, it's 359, sorry. 359. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Similar. So they're dead. But again, so how do you get from one to the other? But you gotta, but you gotta remember, okay, but you're 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 both of these. You have to go valley to the lower. You have to go down, 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 down to the last, that's, that's the So you have a downward right. flow coming down into the valley. Into the valley, and then you would have to have you a flow to go. Upward. But sometimes it does go up. It, sometimes, it surface. sometimes yes. there are flows that go up, and that happens with, yeah. so you need to check with groundwater flow models yes. about the direction that it goes. Well, water I don't know. Water. But okay. here's the thing, is that with the Generally, valley, so with the valley. Water flows towards the valley. Exactly, yes. So, so you would expect water on the other side of the valley to be flowing down the So that groundwater on both sides of the valley would should be, be flowing towards your valley. Should be flowing towards your valley. That as opposed to going down and back up, because the tendency is that your supply on the surface water is coming down from groundwater flow from yes. each direction. So your question was that if, let's say, there was contamination in the depth of the well, mm -hmm. would it turn up at the screen level? And it's, so one of two things, if it's could not, it, could it? well, if it's not, then it's staying at the bottom. Yeah. So if it's there, it's not mixing. Mm -hmm. Or if it was there and mixed, you would be finding it at the spigot. One, it's like one of two dynamics. We'll be going out in the hypothetical case of. We're deep in the hypothetical case. I'm very deep in the hypothetical okay. case. Okay. Um, like how about how about, how about how about let's 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 right. let's yeah. think about it a different way, yeah. right? We, 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 all, we all noticed that we have surface water contamination coming into Salins Pond and no surface water contamination coming out of Salins Pond. Okay. The the Park Brook it runs pretty much. You know that 100 percent? Huh? You know that. Uh, I don't know. I, I, just, I just read these guys' testimony. Yeah, so basically, we have sampled on the, on the other side of Sally's Pond and, and went for a core, went for the out saying it's been not detected every time we sample. Mm -hmm. So we have to go in. I mean, the presumption is it goes in at very low levels to begin with, and then it gets diluted by the water. The water that comes out of the creek in the North Brook, that, that area there is about 20 times as large as the area that's going into it from. From the, uh, I'm sorry, North Brook and Ringwood Creek go into Savage Pond and also Park Brook. Park Brook is where we see the hit. That's because it's coming off of Peter's Mine Pit. Um, but once it gets into Savage Pond, you have 20 times more water coming from another direction. And now think about it from a groundwater perspective, right? right? If you go and, and our closest, say, our closest hit in the groundwater in the overburden is right at Savage Pond, and it was still traveling in the groundwater. Well, it would have to go another two and a half miles. After traveling, it, it, it made it its three quarters of a mile. It has to go another two and a half miles. And as it goes two and a half miles, this contamination, which is already below groundwater quality standards, it's going to be mixing with more clean water. So what do we expect to detect at, you know, at another two and a half miles away if when we get to it, if, if, if at Sally's Pond, it's, it's already below the standards, and we see it, you can, you can see their, their, their studies, it's, you know, 0 0.89, 0 0.76, 0 0.62 as it's going down Sally's Pond. That's what's going on here. It's diluting as it gets down towards our, towards our wells. And then keep in mind the groundwater flow direction in the wells so near Sally's Pond is up. 
it's up in the bedrock and it's up in the over. So it's, a, it's what you would expect, you know, it's, a, you know, it's basically it's coming well, up into the point of helping to feed the, you know, the surface water, 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 water at the bottom right. of the bed. Right, right. But, um, but as we all know, there could be fractures that you're missing. So. Right. And I think that the key here is the testing of levels, because if you ever had a level that was in exceedance, that would be um, a trip for, uh, you know, that would probably trigger some additional research. But well, we're monitoring. Of, of course. I mean, right. I thought of any sort of remedy here. There are going to be sentinel wells, uh, looked at sentinel wells installed, and if we found there were issues with those sentinel wells, uh, we would need to evaluate that and to do some probably further downgrading and monitoring. Which is what's going to happen with the DEP after the record of decision. Yeah. There's going to be, yeah, there's going to be additional the of the wells yeah. that will be indicated on here. I would like to, uh, go ahead. Really quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, well, first off, I think that we can all sleep a little easier with these recent test results. I definitely think it was a great idea that Bro did that. Hey, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, but just out of peace of mind, uh, paying for these this water testing, where did that come from? Did that come out of the municipal budget, or was that out of some like insurance? Or? That's not. No, that's 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 our in our water budget. We do testing as part of our our, oh, our so usual water. Okay. Yeah. So you have a water and testing out. We have we have testing. And I remember that we were talking about it quite some time ago, and I can't recall if we ever got an answer. Um, and if we did, perhaps you could remind me. What pays for Excel Environmental? The insurance companies. The insurance companies pay for that. As, as part of their reservation of rights. They've decided not to defend us in this case. So in order to not defend us, but still hold their insurance contract with us, which they can't get out of the contract, they're going to have to pay for our defense. They pay for our attorney. They pay for our engineer. Since they're not defending you. Since they're not pay. defending us, they're paying us to right. defend ourselves. Mm -hmm. Do you, you know the names of those insurance companies? Uh, I would not want to say. I don't know the names off the top of their head. Now, when you're getting into these things like, I don't know this stuff at all. But when you're getting into stuff like you're getting insured for $87 million or whatever the number is, you don't only have, you've got pools, you've got reinsurers, you've got all you kinds of things money. going on. Wait, you bought these, you bought these policies in 1967. What are the corporate uh, follow-ups and, and how do these, you know, what, whatever that company was at the time, what is it now? Who is that? I, yeah, no. They're just trying to unravel that mess would take a lot of, of, of legal digging that is not worthwhile because we're, you But, know, but somebody's won't. paying for it, but the thing mm -hmm. is is that over the years, they've changed the policies that we're not defending, they have a legal obligation, so they're covering the fees for you. That, I think that's a standard procedure in insurance law. So the insurance carriers that the borough has now were the same insurance carriers? I would say that. No. 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 Yeah. And Luckily, I have 28 billion gallons of water in between 
my well. wells and and the, the top of uh, where Ringwood Creek goes into, into and, the reservoir. And also, so it just, so it just helps with the dilution part of it. What, what we're going to focus on is that the testing was done, what the test results are, and that they'll be tested again in 2019 and 2022. And I think we are around the clock. This is a Bottom line is 
that the um, the premature uh, premature births were higher than in all of those areas that I mentioned. Okay, <clears throat> so that's that's important. Then what they did is they looked at um, various uh, these are all cancers. They looked at cancers and uh, decided which, through statistical analysis, were able to determine that for the, uh, the tribe here in Ringwood, that the incidence of uh, lung and bronchial cancer is high uh, compared to all of those other places. Um, and also cancer of the cervix. And then I also looked at, and the report has a lot more in it, but it takes uh, you know it takes some study to really understand. It was um, a, a statistical analysis of all of all causes of death, and it was in each of those areas uh, again. But it turned out that of all the other areas, um, considering all causes, that include diseases of the heart, neoplasms, cancer, uh, cerebral vascular disease, and uh, lower respiratory disease, and kidney disease that the, um, the all of those things mixed uh, together, the statistical analysis of that, that the rates are again high for the Ringwood uh, community. Um, and th those are the things that really struck me. There are other, other things in here. It's really a very comprehensive report. It was done, it was published in 2015. It was done, um, uh, it was done prior to that. Like, I think it was 2011 um, is when they... Because I remember it took a while to find out for you. Right, right. Yes. right. And and then they came to the a presentation about it. Right. Yes. And it's a request to the chief. I, I yes, to the chief. Right, right. Mm -hmm. It's at his request. So I just think it's really important that we, um, you know, understand that this, this is uh, part of the situation that we're dealing with here. And uh, it goes on. So. I just wanted to share that with you. I need to do it myself because I'm going to be new and I want to understand that more. Thank you. <coughs> and with continuing on with the help, um, let's launch both of these and talk about the NYU presentation coming up. And there are some. Uh, so I'm Lisa Toss. Um, I'm a professor at NYU School of Medicine. Um, and in the Department of Environmental Medicine, and I'm a toxicologist for the last 28 years, studying environmental health impacts. And I got involved with the uh, Grand Foundation in 2013 when they, the leaders um, approached us and asked us um, to do some surveys and find out what concerns and needs of, of the turtle plant were. Um, we've moved on also to the year plan and are hoping to work uh, with the role plan as well. So during that time, in addition to the survey, the people, um, the people wanted to have um, exposures measured. They wanted to know whether there were indeed... Um, can I stand up here? Yes, yeah, sure. please do. Let us see. No, it's okay. Um, whether there were... so. Some of the concerns that the uh, respondents had was whether or not there were potential exposure routes. Um, so you have to understand that uh, this is a sovereign nation, and they do fish, and they hunt, and they eat the animals, and so they wanted to know if there's contamination, and if that contamination has a potential exposure to, to the individual. And so, um, what we did was, we did, uh, we did collections, actually, the citizens uh, did it, so it's a citizen scientist initiative. Um, we went with them as toxicologists to ensure that it was done correctly. We also um, took, um, took uh, samples from ponds and reservoirs and led by um, one of the Ramco um, members. And um, so we went, to, we went to different areas in ponds, we went to reservoirs, we went to creeks, um, we went to even little puddles and around people's homes. 
Um, in addition to that, we did inside water testing of the faucets, um, the water coming out from the faucets, and we also did blood measurements for four metals. Um, so we did not do organics, we did metals. And um, we also, since that time, have set up a collaboration with the New Jersey Institute, uh, NJIT, in, um, in Newark, and uh, they came out and they, they did sites, similar sites to what we did, and we did our measurements, um, our water measurements, both outdoors and indoors, we did that in our own laboratory uh, using instrumentation, and we sent it out to another laboratory at NYU School of Medicine in the dental school, so they also measured the same things that we measured. Um, only many, many more. NJIT collected in similar, similar places as well as additional places and um, they are waiting for their analysis. So we are working together as a team because we thought that um, there's no better way to do this than to join forces. So um, there is a town hall meeting which um, Rina, who's my um, the community outreach coordinator on this project, and we set up a town hall meeting, which will be on June 28th at from 6 to 8 p.m. here in the Church of the Good Shepherd. And at that time, we will um, we will provide the results of all the testing that we did in an anonymous fashion. Um, we will not be mentioning whose homes were who; they'll all be coded. Um, we will be mentioning what the pond, where the ponds were, and where the reservoir, and things like that. And of course, we'll be giving the blood results, but that will also be anonymous. Um, so this will all be given out. We will have a panel of scientists. We will have an air pollution expert um, who, if you've been to any of our other environmental meetings, um, Dr. George Thurston, a leading exposure assessment uh, scientist and epidemiologist, We'll be having a, um, a, a person who looks uh, the water, is very well known for his work in the Hudson River, and if you don't know about that, that's PCBs, as well as many other things. Um, we'll also have one of the people who did the analysis at NYU School of Medicine in the dental department. He will explain what things are, because we all have these very advanced pieces of equipment. Um, who else will be there? I'm sorry. Oh, we're trying to get a, a geologist who spoke at the CAG meeting, who we've conferred with, Alec Gates, on numerous occasions. Um, and we're still trying to get um, a few more scientists who will come. Basically, the purpose of this is to give you our data um, and have refreshments and have um, all the questions and answers that we want. We've invited um, the governing body of, of Ringwood to come. Personally, we've invited Judy Sullivan, who's the attorney, um, with some of the Ramcos, and um, we will personally invite the EPA to, to please come. Um, and it's open for everyone. So we gave you these because we want these posted all over. We, we called the reporter from the Bergen Record. Hopefully they will be coming. And we want this to be a very transparent event. Okay. So again, um, if you have any questions, Trina, her phone number and everything is on there. And um, I hope you can come. And do you think you'll have the NGIT results on that one? Yes, I was thinking about that while I was sitting there. Um, unfortunately, the person that we're interacting with, whose name is um, Lucia Rodriguez, is in Venezuela. And so her, the lab that she sent it to is an independent laboratory. And while we can push the people at NYU mm -hmm. to really yeah. give us this work, um, hers is an independent lab. So um, I hope she does. I hope we do. She can't come. We're hoping to get someone from NJIT that's going to do it and could also come. So if you don't have that data, we would, we 
will be presenting <coughs> the New York University School of Medicine and Dental School to independent labs your results. Mm -hmm. so please, People have questions?
637-5000 or lopez.theater at epa.gov. Sincerely, Peter D. Lopez, Regional Administrator. Uh, I don't know if anybody has heard back from Sophia. Sophia's my boss. Okay. So, yeah. So, so what I so, yes. What I do is we have a calendar for the Regional Administrator. We put requests on that calendar. We've done that. Mm -hmm. um, we just put an end date of like the end of the summer because I can tell you honestly, July is pretty much full for him already. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. So, and also, Joe, Joe mentioned about the timing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. clearly, clearly, yeah. summer's not a good thing. I mean, you can't see anything. I mean, so old for all you can't well, in some areas. So, yeah. so, so, so we just so. wanted to reach out and work out the best time for him and, and Kat. And that time wise. Maybe once the week's fall. Yeah, because we can go back there now and we go over something. Right. It's not late. You can't see it. You know, it's behind that wall. So we go there. You should see it. Are you hearing hides a lot? Yes. Is it agreed that? To look for a date then in the fall and tell you know, yeah. exactly. yeah. 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 work with Well, that helps us too because we can get this calendar right after. Yeah. So that would be helpful. Oh, I think okay. I think so take a look at some dates. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. Now, what are you, what are you thinking about? I told this idea I would ask, like, everybody wants to be there, yes, or the head. So mm -hmm. does it have to be during the day, in the late afternoon, or you know, what works best for you? Well, it's going to be a darker. I was going to yeah. say, yeah. right. Yeah. It's going to be darker. Uh, Nothing 
much more to add, which confirms what you yes. were looking so, at. So basically what we indicated, these are the changes yes. we requested, and in addition, um, as I think we previously noted, the, um, uh, the cornerstone is still working with the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection's Land Use Regulation Program uh, regarding the habitat, uh, the uh, planting plan for the, the repairing zone. So they're still working in those comments. Whatever changes NJDEP requires will be encompassed in the next revision of the uh, RD report. Now, as far as the optical unit three, the uh, site-related groundwater remedial investigation report addendum comments, again, those were provided on May 18th. Uh, basically, I guess to begin, the one thing that these comments don't ask for is essentially additional investigations in order to move forward with remedy selection. We think that there's enough data to move forward with remedy selection, but we do, we do. There were some issues within the report we wanted to address. One of the main things was we wanted the report to address any of the uncertainties related to the investigations uh, that were conducted out there. Any of these sites, any investigation, there's going to be some sort of uncertainty uh, with regards to um, the data and the was collected for that investigation. We wanted that to be sort of brought into the report and that within the report. Is that also referred to as the uh, confidence intervals? Is that same type of thing, or just talk about... Well, we're just basically talking about just the uncertainties with regards to the investigation. I mean, here, one of the things that's been mentioned was, oh, you know, could there be, could there be other fractures if the report goes a little bit in another direction or something like that? Yeah, that's, that's, that's always a possibility. The task contractor brought up the issue, well, could the, the, the highest levels of groundwater go below some of your uh, monitoring wells out there? That's another area of uncertainty that should probably be addressed uh, in the groundwater RI report addendum. In addition, there's also uncertainties and uh, there are certain uh, assumptions and limitations related to the biopore modeling report. Uh, that's something that we felt needed to be, uh, you know, sort of spelled out better in the RI addendum report. So you're not going to change the modeling? We want them to basically explain the limitations of the modeling. I mean, again, could there be? I mean, could there be a more detailed model? We spend more years collecting data and do a more detailed groundwater model. Sure, but what is it going to tell us? Maybe it'll tell us, you know, levels of the elevated one four thousand go another hundred feet or two hundred feet. It's not going to make a dis it's not going to make a difference based on in terms of the decision making at the site. We basically know where the highest levels of contamination are. They're in the in the mine workings uh, based upon our sampling. And any action we're going to take out here is going to focus in on you know, where, where the problem is here. Uh, what the modeling does show is basically it's clearly not expected that this this uh, one four dioxane is ever going to make it to the reservoir. Some other issues, um, uh, we we're looking to bring some of the figures forward into the body of the report. We have a figure section in the report which is basically empty or has one figure and a lot of the uh, figures uh, with regards to contaminant levels and so forth are in the appendix to that report buried in other previously prepared reports. We want those brought forward. Uh, in addition, we want the one uh, figure that was included to be sort of blown up so you can actually read some of the materials uh, on those figures. We also, uh, at, you know, at, per the state's request, uh, we wanted uh, the private portable well search updated essentially for the site to make sure we know where the closest private portable wells are uh, to the site. Is that going to include the barrel wells? Well, that, that's going to basically include any sort of private portable wells that might be in the area, you know. We need to, you know, these types of work have been done in the past. We're just looking forward to, it's been a, a few years, we're looking forward to be updated. Mm -hmm. Just private wells, though? Well, basically any sort of private portable well, yeah. yeah. I mean, we know where the barrel wells are. So clarification on uh, basically where the sources of contamination are. Uh, that, you know, 
contamination, groundwater contamination appears to be coming from the Peters Mine area, the Cannon Mine area, and so forth. I think as we discussed uh, previously, uh, we want uh, a comparison of the one fourth ounce in surface water to not only the ecological base screening level of 22,000 parts per billion, but also the drinking water, you know, the groundwater quality standard of 0.4 parts per billion, given the fact that surface water here discharges to a drinking water source to, to a reservoir. And then, you know, there's just a bunch of other minor changes and comments, typos and so forth uh, within the body of the report uh, that we were looking to have addressed uh, within the report. So, revise the report to address those, uh, those uh, typos and clarifications. Any questions? Comments? Thanks for bringing that forward. Okay. Thank you, Thank you. Sure. Yes. As always. On the next agenda item, I did mention that I still have a deliverable for getting the larger site mass with the sampling printed for... This works for you. That works for you? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. The other piece was asking for visuals on the graphics, and I did find... <coughs> site plans and they are not very satisfying. So what I am going to do is um, I I have them, they're on the Ringwood, <coughs> New Jersey uh, website, there's also Ringwood Facts, and their mechanical drawings of the components that are going to go into the recycling plant. It does not actually show the recycling plant, and there's like a profile of the canopy. So I'm going to do a little bit more work. I did talk to Scott Heck, but it was late in the week, and I'm going to see if we can find additional material because it was mentioned that it'd be easier to understand the project if you knew what it was going to look like. So we did some preliminary investigations, did look at the site designs. It's very technical. It's not uh, user friendly in terms of getting a sense of what it looks like. Uh, an engineer probably will look at it and go, oh, I know exactly what it looks like, but uh, for the lay person, not as helpful. And we're going to move forward to see if we can find something for that. Do we have a, any questions? Did we have the high, the, the high hydrogeologist? Again, that's that basically the draft that we incorporate. Her comments yeah. are incorporated as, as our state's comments uh, that are all incorporated in this and, you know, go towards the past comments into consideration. I have one question now. Uh, the, um, the sand and gravel wells, do they recharge? They recharge for surface and groundwater, correct? I, I would assume so. I don't have that yeah. much details on mm -hmm. the wells other than what was just provided right. here. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, the point of ground, where is that, where is that the ground we're coming from? I assume that it's getting some water to water as well as shallow. Sorry, Probably right. some of it's pulling from, you know, one side of, of the well away from the reservoir, some of it's pulling water from the reservoir into the shallow. All right. On to the administrative aspects. The original operating procedures for the CAG were developed nine years ago uh, with Bob Spiegel, I assume, who laid these out in the foundation for the CAG. And we met with the CAG members after the last meeting to do uh, take an initial review, do some wordsmithing on this document. You'll see the suggested edits in strike text. I would like to work through it, see if there's any changes, if we want to incorporate them. A charter, I see it as an evolving document, and that you, you adapt it as frequently as needed, if conditions change to do that. If you look at it, 
the one comment was real-time solutions is a key part of the purpose of the community advisory group, so we added that in. The original membership was based on efforts that were done almost 10 years ago. We updated it a little bit, eliminated duplicate entries. The PRP and representatives of Ford Motor Company, we struck that because it, it comes later in the document. Originally on page two, item nine, that membership was for two years and the group decided that it would be best to review membership periodically and keep it open. And actually after this, we'll see if there's any members that are being considered to add to the K, knowing that July will be down. Uh, we won't have a meeting in July, but other people we want to reach out to and also help orient them so that when we do convene for the next meeting, that they'll be ready to weigh in on what's uh, the discussions at the time. Uh, what happens if we lose a member? That was pretty much the same. We did look at notes, and we are very grateful <coughs> for the maximum of the notes and transcripts. We were trying to get them two weeks after the CAG meetings, but that's really a little challenging, so we want to try and have them maybe three weeks after the meeting that the notes are available. Craig, is that, is that right? Like I said, we'll do our best. Right. Uh, but two weeks was a little, um, a little challenging. So uh, we're going to update this this piece of it. This was the inquiry that we had. On to page four, what we will do though is keep the agenda 14 days prior to the next meeting. Give it to the tag members to review so that uh, if they have any changes up to five days before. We really want to make sure that anything that gets added to the agenda, unless it's really critical, really time sensitive, is that if there's going to be a presentation, allow people enough time to develop the presentation, get materials out. And then, once we have that uh, agenda, to send it out to the broader email list. And again, if anybody knows of names that people who would be interested, we're going to try and build this email list so that anybody who's interested in following the work of the pen will receive information. Uh, as a matter of fact, on the sign-in sheet, if at the bottom anybody knows, of someone who would like to be added, please add that on. So we'll have a sign sheet and then we'll keep working on building the email list. On page five, um, because the borough of Greenwood has been added as a PRP, we updated that language to include it. Uh, it talks about the liaisons in some situations, it's talked about as an um, ex officio position is that people participate, but they don't really weigh in on the decisions, and we're glad that other agencies are here and weighing in. That's very helpful. We want to have those voices heard, but it, it lists those and talks about the role of the liaisons. On six, we tried to, on page six, the ground rules tried to put a positive spin on it, and so just say, be mindful of the work. <coughs> and then, this is a, interest, uh, this is a different piece. One of the people we have here today is um, Joe Siegel, who is part of, Joe, just give your title a little bit. I know you've done it before, I work for EPA Region 2 and I'm an environmental collaboration and conflict resolution specialist, so 
I do facilitation, mediation, um, and um, so I was invited by Pat uh, and Joe uh, to join you this week, this time and last month as well, just to get a feel of what's going on. And one of the things that we added is that <coughs> the CAG can choose what level of facilitation it wants. So I come in as a neutral third party facilitator. There's also opportunities for support from EPA team to provide facilitation. And in the past, there's been rotating facilitation among the CAG members. And a lot of it will depend on the topic to be presented. So for example, NYU is going to be doing their town hall presentation. They're going to be handling that and organizing it. One size does not fit all, and it makes sense that the K has the level of facilitation support that it wants and it thinks is appropriate for different meetings. And we wanted to point out in the operating procedures that there are a range of options that they could, they could have for their facilitation. Right. Yeah, I just want to make it very clear that NYU does not work with CAD, they do not work with um, the EPA. We are an independent academic yes. environment. We are here at the request of the community of members and the members of the Thank you. And uh, I, I would clarify that maybe Superfund-related events, because, for example, the tour with Pete Lopez, so there's, there's related activities that are going on. You have the CAG meetings proper. Thank you for bringing that up. There's also other activities. And if, if there was a public meeting, <coughs> for instance, that EPA wanted to hold, if they wanted a facilitator, they could. Um, but there's related efforts, and those are all to be determined by the parties involved. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and that was, I think, the main pieces to the changes in the operating procedures. Does anybody have comments or questions? Tag members, if you'd like to change something further. I just have a message for you. Okay, often. <laughs> if you're going to send me mail, could you please put your name on the outside of the envelope? Oh, uh, yes. My life has been threatened, so the packets I received, I have to take to the police station because I was not, you know, I know I didn't order no baggies. Apologies. So the one I know, it had University of Virginia on yeah, the outside, right, right, yeah. but then I was late on the others and I wanted her to get it in advance so it was FedEx package that looked anonymous. Oh, okay. I uh, I apologize. You don't need any extra drama in your life. I was no. trying yeah, to help, also, right? Um, sadly, I want to say that my sister-in-law got diagnosed with cancer today. Oh. today. And we have one of the members of the community. She's in her early 20s, mid-20s. Uh, she's got it so bad, you know, it's a fundraiser that's going to be held tomorrow night, but she's not expected to survive because, uh, you know, she's got three young kids. But uh, again, the cancer thing is a real big thing. You know? yeah. And it's only totally very upsetting, you know, when you go to wake up every day and somebody's diagnosed with cancer. You know, and you, 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 you know, those are not people who stand on that person. It really hurts. A lot of praying and holding. I think that everyone here in this room has probably met challenges, perhaps not to this extent and this consistency. I would say that you have the support of everyone in the room. I know that doesn't make the situation better. But we hear you, and thanks to Gretchen's reports, and thanks to the work of NYU, I think this information and reporting out, Vivian, thank you for sharing that. It's an honor, <coughs> but I hear you say that. Anything else? And I will put my turn address on there.
Anyone else comments about the procedures? Graphic for the Superfund process. Uh, that is this little diagram. We had some comments the last time. Yeah. Did everybody pick this up? This is what you'll see here is that this is the general flow of steps for a Superfund process. It was not clear that it's sequential, so we've added a background arrow. I hope that is helpful and clarifying. And here it shows that operating unit three is, is in the early stages, and OU2 is further down, and maybe we have to move that arrow down a little more notch since the comments have been sent back. During the discussion in the remedial action work plan, there's a lot of details that are of special interest to the K and community members because this is where we start to talk about the work that's going to be done and how it's done. And Joe, if I've miscaptured any of this, let me know. And we. I try to provide extra details up here to these boxes or in the dashed lines to really inform a little bit more. On the final remedial design report, there is mention of the temporary cul-de-sac. Oh, I thought I spelled this wrong. And uh, um, a temporary driveway. So there's some information there in the final remedial design report, but down here you'll see the additional levels of information that are going to be coming out as the project moves along, specifically about the noise control, monitoring thresholds when uh, action needs to be taken, more specifics about the truck routes, and I think that Vivian in the past asked about bus stops for the kids, Dust control, oh, monitoring of dust, and you're going to be doing monitoring for um, yeah, air, air quality. And it's beyond the dust. Uh, what's you're checking for? Is, what's one of the other things you're going to be? Well, I mean, it's going to be monitoring for dust, but also wherever this work is going to have to be, obviously, some organics monitoring kind of in the work zone, especially where the work is. Material. All right. Um, and should any paint sludge or drum remnants be discovered, uncovered, that those will be disposed off site, and that is part of the paint sludge and drum remnant excavation plan? That's where I want to try to pause you. This is where I have to off, off site disposal of them, like paint sludge or whatever. Yes. When we're, when we're, at this, we're talking about the can on there. Basically, well, that's bringing the cold stack. No, no, I mean, as far as the paint sludge is going to be, there's a possibility of uh, finding paint sludge that appears my face would be the one thing on the collar. I would expect it might be some paint sludge there. Also, when you're moving the O'Connor disposal area, there's a possibility while moving some of the materials back to uh, from the, the low line areas into the area where it's going to be packed, there's a possibility that there could be some paint sludge. You know, my house. So basically, that's the offsite area that you're talking about, where they're going. You know, no. Offsite no, means. Be looking. The offsite means this would be moving materials that they find materials. Yeah. Materials will be in. They'll be in under the plan that we develop, which will have them staged, sampled, and then shipped offsite to an appropriate landfill. Oh, all right. So yeah. not. Not in the area. Are the ones that I've seen. No, no. no I mean, yeah. basically, whatever they are, it's going to go offsite. And then there was a clarification that EPA oversees the work during construction with inspection at the end, and I'm not sure I captured this correctly, but that NJDEP would probably be part of the final. Yeah, typically NJDEP participates in the uh, the, uh, the inspection and. Often, when the work is ongoing, we have, uh, you know, I'll be able to see, oversee some of the work, but we typically 
typically have somebody here full time uh, during that phase, and it's usually someone with the uh, Army Corps of Engineers. So the Army Corps isn't at the so end. So it'll be the EPA or one of our representatives will be okay. out here uh, overseeing. I'll correct that, and we'll go to version three of this. Um, and then what? There were some changes in this final box down here. The contractor develops so the remedial action work plan. These may be different components of the remedial action work plan or separate plans. It depends. Yeah, I mean, there'll be a larger plan. It depends upon the contract how they do it. And a lot of times, these, uh, like the health and safety plan, the quality assurance project plan, is another plan. Those will be attached as appendices to the larger remedial action work plan. They're all these other plans that need to be developed uh, in order for the work to be implemented. And then the riparian wetland restorations well, That's plan. actually already been in the process of being developed. So that's uh, being developed. That's being developed as part of the uh, art remedial design process. Okay. Um, and it's uh, being developed, uh, as we had discussed, they, the contractor is currently working with NJTP's land use regulation program to uh, sort of finalize the, uh, the and the riparian and wetlands uh, restoration plan, so plan. Okay. Is this a better format? Does this understanding yes. that we still need to revise it for accuracy? <coughs> well, kind of work as you was explaining. I said kind of work as you was explaining when yes. you were down. But I just heard one, I got one for you. <laughs> I didn't make the last meeting, but the meeting before you gave handouts, all right? Yes. Now, when I was scanning those handouts now, and if I'm not mistaken, it says that if there's any natural resources or whatever, you know, that's what I complained about all our fruit trees, blah, 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 and everything lives off, that stuff will be easy to really um, restore these areas. And the, no, DEP doesn't restore them. The DEP will can pursue natural resource injuries, yes. So if, you, if there are natural resource injuries, including groundwater, which is a natural resource of the state, um, the DEP is a trustee and can pursue injury or damage, you know, file a damage claim against the responsible party okay. for that. We wouldn't do the actual restoration. <coughs> File a claim and you get money from the responsible yeah. party to do the restoration, or you would have them do it the restoration. Okay. And Ken, was that related to the program that was on hold while you were waiting for the commissioner to be appointed? Did well, it was on hold in a sense because the last administration did not pursue any natural resource injuries or damage claims in the past eight years. So the program was kind of. You know, and hold until the new commissioner comes in and makes a decision on how she wants to operate the Office of Natural Resource Injuries. So um, they don't really know yet what the commissioner's plan of operation is for their program. Will she appoint someone then to oversee that program and then at that point maybe that person could come here and explain it to us? Yeah, I mean, there are people in that program, there have been, they never yeah. left. Um, I know. Some of them have changed positions. But yeah. there is a program of people that do that kind of stuff, and they still do uh, natural resource restoration work at other sites in the state. Mm -hmm. They have a pot of money. Um, it just in the past administration, they didn't file any new claims. Mm -hmm. uh, they were just doing the restoration work with the money they had over the past few years. So they're not sure where the program's going in the future of the new administration. Just yet. Yeah. I'm definitely in for it.
Well, uh, there will definitely be sampling within the areas itself, uh, but I mean, the whole details with regards to what the, the sampling plan, that's going to be developed by the remedial contractor. Uh, the remedial action contractor will review it to determine whether or not it's appropriate. Um, but there will definitely, at a minimum, there'll be sampling uh, in the areas where they're doing work because, you know, the workers will be the ones that will be most likely exposed to it. Again, all the details of that will be sort of fleshed out in the health and safety plan that will be part of the remedial action work plan that will be developed by the remedial action contract. And what's the timing on that? That again, the timing on that depends upon when we reach. Right, right now, we're talking with the Ford Motor Company, we're negotiating an enforcement agreement. It depends upon when that agreement is basically finalized. And that will set the clock running for the submittal of a remedial action. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Last item are the progress reports. And these also are courtesy of the NACMAS. They submit them to EPA monthly requirement. And have shared them. Uh, Joe, anything that you want to talk about? Uh, the one I'm handing out right now is dated June, it's for May. And there was also the... Yeah, there's one that goes along with each of the uh, operable units, basically, with regards to the uh, RIFS work, and the ground RIFS work, and the you know, legal title work. We kind of already discussed where we are in the process. We basically submitted comments and those documents are both in the process of being revised. Did you hear that, Liz? And with that, coming into the last part of this, we try to make sure that if people have questions, that we ask them throughout the course of the meeting. Does anyone have comments or questions that they would like to weigh in? Any insights from the meeting tonight? I'm going to review the next steps. Again, we do not have a July meeting. When we move into August, it's a little review, but it certainly seems that there should be an update based on the NYU presentation at whenever the next meeting occurs. And thank you for the work that you have done and the citizen science and building capacity and bringing that information forward. Very, very much appreciated. Can I, can I just add something that I forgot to say? Um, so the data that's going to be presented, of course, means nothing without control sites. So there are people um, whose uh, house water, water was tested who don't live in the Superfund area. Um, and of course, uh, blood work was done, same thing. And so just wanted to say that there are, are people within the Superfund site area who were tested, and the ponds were tested inside and outside. And then items moving forward, we're going to look to see if it's possible to get a PDF of the well sites map, follow up on the dates for the site visit, looking for the fall, follow up on visuals for the recycling center to see if we can get a sense of what that project looks like, a revise of the super fun process handout. Sounds like we're getting closer though. And then the NRD program update once the commissioner comes on board, gets to identify some of their priorities and how that might move forward. Is there anything else that people want to have on an agenda that they know of right now? Anything that you would add? To make sure that it goes on the agenda, we're about to just take the deal about it. Yeah, yes, that's a, you yeah, can't okay. see it because it's all oh, okay. board, but yes, yeah. that's exactly what we have. And the commissioner is coming on 
board probably needs to as staffing that they need to look at a review of the programs, decide what they want to do. I suspect it'll take a little bit of time for the transition. And thank you to our videographer. Uh, we appreciate it. And the YouTube. One of the things that I will do is make sure that we send out the link uh, so that you can see the YouTube uh, recording of it. Of uh, that moving meetings. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The meetings have been taking place at the library. This is closer to the Upper Ringwood community. <coughs> we didn't have a presentation tonight, but we have a projector. We can reconfigure the room for when we have um, presentations and make the presentations here. The suggestion is to move the meetings to Good Shepherd on an ongoing basis, and if I suppose if there was a time conflict, we'd have to look for something else. But uh, well, I think that we're all set for a year. You know, uh, any comments or thoughts about this? It would be the second Thursday of the month at the church, seven o'clock at the church instead of the library, because the time is better and it's closer to the community, and we're hoping that. As we go forward, more people from the community will come to the meetings. Yeah, yeah. 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 we'll encourage more people. Right. Absolutely. So, you know, this is the first one we've had, so <coughs> get the word out there. <coughs> that was my question. <coughs> so, I've been coming to Cat meetings for a very long time, and I'm shocked that a few residents and members, I mean, the last meeting in the library, I guess, I think there were about 35 people there. Just eyeballing it. And so I wondered, you know, I agree with you theoretically that this is close to the community, that there are more people. Um, what can we do? You're a nasty lady and I bet you if people show up to 28, <coughs> you have that magic word. Residents. Um, no. 
if there are other organizations yes. out there, they're certainly welcome too. You know, we like to have as diverse a group as possible <coughs> with a lot of different viewpoints with a lot of different people. You know, I'm with Vivian and I know she's trying to get some other people and here. Everybody can stay here. You know, some people did try out to make lives. I mean, but they that most of her life here. But that didn't prevent them, you know, as I thought about it. But this sense of immediately now, I've been here, you know, all my life, and if chemicals are here, in here. You take me to Texas, that's not going to take the hell out of my body, you know? I mean, so a lot of people have lived in the area a long time prior, you know, moving on in life, but they don't have very health problems, so I feel they should have an input as well as the rest. That's they right. They were there when this happened, you know? They witnessed everything, mm -hmm. so that's... And those people certainly... You know, are, are a part of the history of this, exactly. and so it's not just Greenwood residents or Greater Greenwood residents, because those experiences and expertise of what was lived and what was witnessed is still very uh, important. Yes, very, very important. important. And also, this is uh, something that I will. It's a new thought, but especially because these processes do take time, and people can get burned out. If people came forward and wanted to come for a particular meeting and just make a statement and weigh in and provide their advice to the group, it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be an ongoing commitment because month after month it can be it can be a bit much. And we want to hear from people about what they think needs to happen here or what they would like um, for assurances for the community moving forward. Unfortunately, those that witness themselves, you know, murder during that time span, but just dying every week or whatever, you know, you have to be part of those what my mind. I mean, I don't understand much and yeah, you know, have much interest because you know it's not something they ever actually lived and watched and you know, right there on the scene, you know, the president mm -hmm. right there you know all of it. We're gonna try to catch some of these while we're still alive if they have the interest. Yeah. So it doesn't matter. I'm very bitter over it. Okay? Because I I I hold Greenwood responsible. Go ahead. Mayor Van Gorsh was the mayor at the time. And I think it was done to try and get rid of the people. He should never allow that to happen. And I blame Greenwood for it all. They have never, never treated the people up there the way they should be treated. There's no way they could go forward. Because I bought a house in Upper Greenwood Maple. And you never guess what my what my deed said. At the time, they called us Negroes. And on my deed, it said that house was not to be sold because the railroad company owned it to a Negro, which is Ford, AKA Ford. Yeah, yeah, they did terrible things to the people. And I'm 84 years old. I've seen it. I've lived it. My grandparents, my great grandparents, lived here. Of course, I've been out of here 50 years, but my heart is still here. I have relatives here, and I don't like the way the people are being treated. They've never been treated right. Just like this 100th year anniversary, you'd think they'd be doing something. But who was here 100 years ago? Not Topsoil, not Lakers, not Skyline Way. So what are they doing? Nothing. Nothing. They should be doing something, why not go up there and ask the people the history? There was a woman just turned 90 years old last week. When my grandmother and grandfather were here, they got uh, plaques saying they had lived in Ringwood the longest. And that was when Ringwood was 50 years. What are they doing now for 100? You think they would be doing something? So recognition. Yeah, and not they're, they're not doing anything. And respect. Yes. I can remember when there was all, all, one policeman, Hank Roach, where'd he come from? Up there. Roy McCaskill, where'd he come from? Up there. Where'd Warwick's family come from? Up there. 
That was a mixed community years ago. A vibrant community. Yeah, yeah. When the mind was going, it was a mixed community. Now, they, they alienated the people. They wonder why they didn't go forward. How could they go forward? They were held back. They were held back. For God to say that on that deed. You know, and, and I got I got my grandfather's tax bill for 1918. I got receipts from the store. I stood as a little kid and watched. They made six dollars a day. They could only get three dollars a day out of that store, but yet pay, they never had any money from it. Company towns. Yeah. I worked in a Boston. I was supposed to clean toilets. I was about 14, 15 years old, but I worked in the stand. I went to get my pay, and guess what Mr. White said, who was the head of the Ringwood Company, who ran Ringwood at the time? He was going to take my pay for my stepfather's bill and tell my grandmother I'm down there. And she said, that's true. She said, I raised her. She's not paying anybody's bill. And she said, you're going to give her her money, and you're going to give it to her now. But I have to remind that you still work there every day. Yeah, I've always worked. <laughs> but I, I just don't like the way that people have been treated and still are being treated. I mean, I'm not here anymore, but I'll fight for her. I'll fight for her. I was, when I lived here, I was vice president of the PPA. I was county committee woman. It's because of me that there's a head start. It's because of me that those houses were built. And I left in the middle of it, and they got cheated. They got cheated. Yeah, William Van Donkey's a good man, but he didn't know how to handle the crooks. I think you got that from your brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I, I'm, I'm vicious about the way the people have been used. Tell how old your grandmother did to be in Upper Ringwood. 104 and a half. Right. So you got many years ago. Yeah. 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 And we're yeah. right up until then. Yeah, she she worked for Green Engineering. But we always lived, there was houses on the Green Engineering property. And one thing that I really resent, there's a school up there on the hill that the Hewitts had built for the people of Greenwood that went to the fourth grade. People don't even know it's there. That school should be on display. Yeah. Why isn't it? You know, it's just not right what they done. My grandparents went to that school. But as far as I'm concerned, the Hewitts ran this place like a plantation. That's the way they ran it. And that's why the people were thumbs down. Thank God. Under the thumb, too. Yeah, thank God I was on the tail end. That's all I got to say. We've been over there, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, my grandmother said when Norman Green and them came to the school, they had the curtsy to them. Can you imagine? Mm. <coughs> I could not imagine. No. No. Mm -hmm. And that's why. As Shirley says, it's continuing, and that's why this the community really doesn't come to a lot of the meetings. We don't trust. We no, don't we don't trust, trust anybody. Uh, means uh, they uh, were going to clean up the old town landfills, the EPA, the record of decision, and then the borough of Greenwood stopped it. No cleanup, cover up, cap. Well, I think and people live there. Well, I believe the people, some of the people have life rights. My grandmother had life rights. They paid my grandmother to move. And if she had life rights, the rest had life rights too. Yeah. So, I believe there's something in there. I have two of the wheels from the units. And just like that ball fell down there, that was wheels and the people of Greenwood. Who was up there? Now it's fenced in. They don't even dare go on it. What they do, they built that little rinky-dinky thing up there in the monastery. 
for a ball pill. And it says right in that will, that ball pill is will to the people of Redwood. I've got two wills. Now I'm going to pass and get the third one. You go through the one history. Yeah, there's a lot of history. There's a lot of history, and what we can see is that this site, there are a lot of issues. The, the contamination from dumping is one piece of it. It's the fabric of uh, history of dynamics that are going on. And what was mentioned here is that it's not been acknowledged, it's not been respected, and that's part of the ongoing fight. And there's a lot of threats to this. I've got newspapers way back, even in Citizen, when crop we had. And Van Horst told me, and I've got a picture of that too, he was going to build a big development up there, a gated community. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, well, where, how are people going to buy these houses? You know, it was all done to get the people out of there. That's what I say. Girl, in my opinion, uh -huh. it is a gated community. Right. Yeah, yeah. No gates, everybody can't see. There was there used to be a gate there years ago. They called it white gate. White gates, that's right. right. Mm -hmm. When they it's went gated. up in the mines. It's gated. There was a lot of Polish people that lived up there years ago. I've got a girl who was born up there that I went all through school for. Kindergarten, Red Army High School. Even, even in the school, the teachers, Miss Ross, she was the principal. Every day we had to eat. You're going to turn out no good, just like your mothers and fathers. Jeez. And I'd sit there and I'd see you and I'd say, I'm going to fool you. And it looks like you have succeeded. Yeah. Well, I was the first one to ever graduate from high school that lived up here. We need to get away with that. And that surely some people can be with some history someday. Right. Yeah. I tell her all the time to write, write, write. She knows too much, you know? Well, this is not, so not related to my job here with the super, but I will say that there's opportunities to record the histories of people and the voices that are still here. And, um, we hear your comments, and there are opportunities that really people probably don't want to lose. I thought it was so glad we heard this tonight. So you know, Harbor King was a year years ago. We came through right that way. Farm Road. Right, which we can't get through here. By my right help, well, in this trail. Well, right Farm Road through. ended right up here uh, before the resident have the, the, the road park, mm -hmm. the maintenance, yeah, and then it went Marker King, but this part of Marker King wasn't here. We have applauded for every other speaker, so I would like to applaud the comments.